Welcome Garden Church. Let's worship our God one time again. Here we go. Sing this with me. Waar u verschijnt. Waar u verschijnt. Wordt alles nieuw. Want u bevrijdt. En geeft leven. Elke storm verstilt. Door de klank van uw stem. Alles buigt. Alles buigt van Koning Jezus. U bent de held die voor ons strijdt. U bent de weg van overwinning. Oh, en elke vijand vlucht, ieder bolwerk valt neer. Zing maar mee naam, naam boven alle namen, hoogste Heer. In uw grote naam, Jezus overwinnaar. De duisternis ligt op door u. De duivel ligt, zing maar mee, door u verslagen. Oh, en dood, waar is je man? Is je prikkel gebleven? Want Jezus leeft en ik zal leven. De schepping, de schepping kniel. In diep zijn zak. De hemel juicht. Hey, voor onze koning. Oh, en de machten van de hel. We weten wie. Goedemorgen allemaal, welkom bij deze online dienst van International Church The Garden. Leuk dat je kijkt. Nou, corona heeft ons weer voor een aantal nieuwe uitdagingen gesteld en daarom hebben we het schema van de diensten iets aangepast. Zo is er elke tweede zondag van de maand een get together. Daarbij komen we samen op twee verschillende momenten en met een Engelse dienst en een Nederlandse dienst met maximaal 30 personen. Daarnaast is er op elke vierde zondag van de maand een online dienst, zoals vandaag. De andere zondagen vullen we in met kleine groepen, bijvoorbeeld met de home group, een gebedszondag of bijbelstudies. Nou, we zijn heel dankbaar voor de greenhouse, waar we in kleine groepen dus met elkaar kunnen komen. En uh, aankomende zondag 1 november is er een special over parenting under pressure. Um, deze zondag is speciaal voor ouders met kinderen van 0 tot 12 jaar. En natuurlijk is er ook een speciaal kidsprogramma. Alle informatie over de activiteiten kun je vinden op onze website en houd ook even de social media in de gaten. 
En daar vind je ook een link van Eventbrite om je als ouders aan te melden voor dit event. Daarnaast is op zondag 1 november s'avonds ook een Brave Night voor alle jongeren vanaf 12 jaar. En kwart over 7 gaan de deuren open, mis het niet. En verder zijn we ook heel blij om aan te kunnen kondigen dat we de Freedom in Christ cursus gaan organiseren met alle homebook groups. In november starten we daarmee en je homebook leader zal je op de hoogte brengen van wat de plannen zijn en wat de bedoeling is. Het is echt een super gave cursus en die moet je zeker niet missen. Kijk ook eventjes op de website met, uh, nou ja, bij de homegroup pagina waar je meer informatie kan vinden. Vandaag gaan we verder met onze serie over identiteit. Evert zal spreken over identiteit onder druk, uh, gebaseerd op het boek Daniel. Daarom beginnen we zometeen met een worship song, Another in the Fire. En um, dan wil ik nu graag deze dienst uh, openen in gebed. Bidden jullie met me mee? Machtige Vader God, we danken u dat we deze dienst online mogen vieren. We nodigen u uit, Heer, dat u in onze harten werkzaam mag zijn. Dat we mogen opmerken wat u ons wil leren. We danken u dat we zo samen mogen komen. In Jezus' naam. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is on the fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. When I look at the space between where I used to be. And this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the water Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden When another died for me There was another in the fire Sing all my dead All my dead left for dead beneath the water No longer a slave to my sin anymore. Should I fall in the space between what remains of me and his reckoning? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. Well, let's shout it out. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire. The 
be another in the fire Standing next to me You'll be another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me Look how the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you be I can see I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness falls to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between the feet. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between. Come on. Standing next to me will be another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding The power set me free Come the joy of my free battle Cause I know that's where you'll be See, I count Come the joy of my free battle Oh, that's where you be Count the joy of my free battle Cause I know that's where you be Sing it again Count the joy of my free battle Cause I know that's where you be Count the joy of my free battle Cause I know that's where you be Amen He's in the fire, he's in the water Praise today. Amen. We've been talking about identity the last few weeks. If you've missed the sermon, please check out our YouTube channel. To know who you are and to know who you can be in Christ is key, especially in these times. It's really an important topic, whether you're young or old. We're looking into the story of Daniel, and this is part two. The background of the story is that Israel was far from God. Injustice, immorality, worshipping of false gods. God wasn't happy about this and had important prophets like Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Zephania warn against this. And around 600 before Christ, their prophecies came true. God allowed the most powerful empire of the time, Babylonia, to occupy Israel and destroy the land. And after the fall of Jerusalem, about a quarter of the population of Judah was taken as prisoner of war to Babylon for about 70 years. And not just people, but carefully selected for knowledge, skills and beauty. And last week we looked into the life of a young boy, Daniel. He's 15 years old when he's taken captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And it's a trip on foot of over a thousand kilometers. And he's then selected into the program to get a three-year education, or maybe we should say an indoctrination program, to be prepared to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. They changed his name, his culture, his language, gave him an education in local sciences, and they wanted to change his diet. But Daniel refused. He was resolved to keep to the dietary regulations of Israel, the so-called kosher food. It's a famous story, and many of us have heard of the Daniel diet, water and vegetables for 10 days. The story showed four important characteristics of Daniel. He showed discipline, integrity, courage, and humility. We all need that. Another famous story in the same book, Daniel, is about the fiery furnace. You can find it in Daniel chapter 3. The story happens about 15 years later. So Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Mesach and Abednego, by the Babylonian names, are now in their mid-30s. King Nebuchadnezzar is the most powerful man in the world. And what often comes with that is an ego and this leads to the next test. This test, however, is a little bit bigger than the diet one. Let's read this in Daniel 3. King Nebuchadnezzar makes an image of gold. It's 90 feet, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And he puts it in Dura, in the province of Babylon, and it's in a plain, and he summons all of the officials to come for the special dedication of this image. And once they're assembled for this dedication, um, they have to stand before it. Then there is somebody who loudly proclaims, it's a herald, 
nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of, let's say, the royal orchestra, and worship the image of gold that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. You have to bow down. Let's stop there for a minute. It's not clear if the statue is of Nebuchadnezzar or a Babylonian god, but it is huge and the people are required to worship it, worship it instead of the one true God. So 2,600 years ago, how does this apply to us today? Well, today we find images larger than life all around us. Everywhere we see huge images to worship. We go to the movies or we look, watch Netflix and we idolize actors. In stadiums, we look at soccer players and athletes and what do you think of music concerts or the internet itself? We worship physical beauty. The sharp and sexy looking people matter. Wealth, success, fame, power, popularity. These are all images and just as real. Let's read on. In chapter 8, at this time, some officials come forward and they denounce the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. They're buttering him up here. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the king's orchestra must fall down and worship the image of God, of gold. And whatever, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews who have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, the three friends. So be careful, uh, take notice, Daniel is not part of this story. But the three friends, Sadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they're not paying attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. So if you reject the world's idols and images, there's always going to be somebody who wants to get, uh, to get to you or wants to burn you in some kind of way. The orchestra plays and everybody falls on their face to worship the big idol. But the three guys, they're standing up, they're standing tall. And this made some people upset. They wanted to burn them. <laughs> you know what? These are the other governments. These are their colleagues. We, we don't know why they did this. Because they're Jews, foreigners, or they wanted the jobs of, of the three friends? Are they jealous and just competitive? Or were they used by Satan? Because these men honored God and Satan doesn't like anybody who honors God. Just know, when you go to work, there are going to be people at your work that want to burn you. They're going to want to burn you for whatever reason they have. If we read further in the story and we come to 3.13, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned the three friends. So the men were bef brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? So if you do the right thing, you're honest, you have integrity, you show character, or any other Christ-like quality, it's going to make some people angry around you. And don't think that if you would be perfect, everybody would love you. No, they won't. Jesus was perfect and they killed him. They put him on the cross. So even if you're perfect, there are going to be people who will be angry with you and try to burn you. Just know and expect that when you stand for Christ or you stand for integrity at work or any other place, it's going to make people mad. Now, the question is, why did these guys not bow down? Everybody's doing it. Everybody is kneeling. I think the reason why they wouldn't do it was breaking the first of the two Ten Commandments. God, t top ten. If, if you look at with me on the screen, the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And the second one is, you shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. So, number one, you shall not have any other gods before me. You know, whatever is first place in your life is your god or an idol. God says you're not going to have other gods before me. You might say, well, God is my god. No. Whatever you think about most in life is what you love the most. 
and what you love the most is your God. The second commandment is, you shall not make yourself an idol, and you shall not bow down for it. So they will not bow down because it's in the Ten Commandments. And the second reason is because this is why they are in Babylon. God has been warning Israel for years. I started the sermon with that part. These guys are worshipping idols. They've been doing this for generations. They've stopped worshipping the real, true God. Worshipping idols. If you don't stop, I'm going to take you off to Babylon. And that's the whole reason why these guys are in Babylon as prisoners of wars, because their parents had broken the very first command. They loved something more than God. If we read on in 15, 315, now when you hear the sound of the royal orchestra, and if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue from my hand? So here Nebuchadnezzar is making it into a little God contest. Who is really God? Me or your supposed God? When I throw you into fiery furnace, who's going to protect you? Not your God. We'll see who is really God. I'm really God here. That's what Nebuchadnezzar says. If we read further, it actually says that the three friends reply to him and says, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves in this matter. If we're thrown in the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Take a good look at the response of these three friends. It's in 316. The first of all is they don't worry about defending themselves. So if you go to work and the heat is on for being a Christian or for making a moral stand or for doing the right thing and somebody doesn't agree with you, doesn't like it, just quietly trust God to take care of your attackers. The second thing is they remembered God has the power to save you. So for you, it doesn't matter what kind of mess you're in, what kind of crisis or difficulty you're in right now. God is God, which means he can do anything. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we worship is able to save us. That's quite a statement. We know our God is able. He's got the power to save us, but that's not enough. Because the third thing is, you need to believe that God will save you. That's what the three friends did. When you're in a problem, when you're in a crisis, you not only have to believe that God has the ability to save you, you must believe that he will. You must expect that he will save you. And then they announced their loyalty to God no matter what. They said this, God has the ability to save us. We believe he will save us. That's pretty courageous. They're in front of this fiery furnace and we're going to be thrown into it. And they're announcing their loyalty to God no matter what. We know he can save us, we believe he will save us, but if he doesn't, we're not going to back out. If you read on in 19, Nebuchadnezzar gets furious with the three friends and his attitude towards them changed. Actually, it says his face, his facial expression changed. And he orders the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than normal. Some of his strongest soldiers have to capture the man and bind them and then throw them in the fire. It's so hot by that time that these guys actually get burnt and, and, and die, in the, the, the soldiers that is, in that blazing fire. And they throw them in, all three of them. King Nebuchadnezzar got really, you know, he was already angry, he got even more angry, his facial expression distorts. And that's because the three guys give him a direct challenge. He claims uh, to his claim of power and to be like a god. They said, no, we're not going to bow down. So Nebuchadnezzar, of course, gets very angry. And he commands then that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, why does he do that? Why is that necessary? I mean, a human being is going to fry at normal temperature, but he wants it seven times hotter. This is what you call overkill. It's really unnecessary. And I think he's probably doing this because Nebuchadnezzar is worried that the Hebrew God might actually help them out. 
So he says, let's just make this thing for sure. Reading further in 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they said, yes, certainly, your majesty. And he says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, what happens when you trust God in the furnace? Well, not your furnace, maybe your big problem at work or at school. The first is God will take you through the fire. You won't be alone. We just sang about that. There's another in the fire. God's presence will be with you over and over again. God has promised his presence no matter what you go through, if you will trust him. He says, I will be with you. He said he looked like an angel. He's looked divine. I think it was the Son of God. Jesus was walking through the fire with them. And he has promised to walk through the fire with you too. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And almost the last words that Jesus gave at the great commandment before he goes back to heaven were these words in Matthew 28, 20. Jesus said, I will always be with you to the very end of the age. I will always be with you. In Isaiah 43, we find a similar promise. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. It's Isaiah 43, verse 2 and 3. Do you notice that the verse he says, when, not if, when you go through the fire, when you go through the storm, when you go through the flood. This is a certainty in your life. You're, gonna go, you're going to go through the fire many times in your life. Count on it. So you just need to know what to do when that happens. Reading further. King Nebuchadnezzar leaps to his feet and says, weren't there three men tied up that we threw into the fire? And he says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed. And he looks like a son of the God. I just said that. And then in Isaiah 48, we'll come back to that later. I have refined you, but not in the way silver is refined. Rather, I've refined you in the furnace of suffering. You know, if you're in the fire, God will actually burn off everything tying you down. Notice in this fire, and we will see that later on, they didn't get burned. Their clothes aren't even singed. The only thing that got burned off were the ropes they had been tied up with. Now, my question to you is what's got you tied up? What's holding you back? What are the limitations in your life that God wants to burn off? You know, God may take you through the fire to burn off the stuff, the stuff that's tying you down, the limitations in your life. And after a test like that, you're not the same person as you had been before. You are refined and you grow in that type of fire. God can use these situations to burn off stuff that's holding you back. This is what the Bible calls the refining fire. And I just mentioned Isaiah 48.10. You can see it on the screen. You're likely not going to go through a fiery furnace, but you are going to go through the furnace of suffering many, many times. And God is refining you in that type of fire. We're almost there. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar goes to the door or the mouth of the, of the, uh, the, the fiery furnace and he says, Shadrach, Mesach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And the officials all gather together and they see the three, the, the three men whose bodies were in the fire, but the fire had no power over it. The hair of their head, nothing was singed and their garments are not affected and the smell of fire is not even on them. So, you know, God, when you're in the fire, will make sure that you come out unharmed. But let's go first to the story, what it says there. Here's what happens. Servant of the Most High God. Where did that come from? This was a little God cont cont contest, remember? That's an interst instant conversion right here in front of everybody else. Servants of the Most High God. Come out, come out at once. So the three men stepped out of the fire. 
Notice that Nebuchadnezzar didn't invite number four, the fourth man, out of the fire. I don't think he wanted to face the fourth man in the furnace. They come out and then it says this, they didn't even smell of smoke. Nothing had touched them. God is on their side and God makes sure they come out unharmed. And in verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar says, blessed be God of the three friends who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's worth and yielded their bodies that they should not serve and worship any god except their own god. If you trust God when the heat is on and you show faith in the furnace, it will bring unbelievers to God. It's a testimony. It will bring other people that don't know Christ, that don't know God, to him. How you handle pain, how much you trust God. When you're in pain, when you're under pressure in your life, that will probably be your most powerful testimony in your life. You're not much of a witness when everything is going great in your life. But when you're faithful to God and you trust God when you're in pain, when you're under pressure, when you're in the fire and people go, how are they doing that? How are they handling all of that? That's a witness, that's a testimony to God. And these guys really impressed the king. And again, he is the most powerful emperor at that age. Notice what happens in 328. The king said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who sent his angel to rescue his servant. They trusted in him. They trusted in him. That's why they're coming out unharmed. And in 29, if you read it, he makes a decree and he still promises that anybody who doesn't follow that decree will be cut in pieces, so he's still a number one dictator. But he also says there's no other God who can deliver like this. 2,500 years later, that statement is still true. There is no God who can save you except the real God. Who are you looking for to save you out of your crisis, out of your fiery furnace? Are you trying to save yourself? Are you looking for the government to save you? There is no other God that will save you. And you need a savior. That's why we have Christmas. For unto you is born this day a savior, who is Christ the Lord. You know, there's no other way you're getting to heaven without a savior. If you could, God wouldn't have wasted the time of sending his son. You need a savior. So Nebuchadnezzar is right on this in verse 29. He's saying there's no God who can save you. And as we close, I've got this one question for you. Where are you feeling the heat today? Is there job pressure, peer pressure at school, maybe even at work? The pressure to conform and to do what everybody else is doing and worship the wrong images and the idols in our culture? Can you pass the test the way the three guys did? Let's pray. Dear God, you know the problems I'm facing right now. And you know the fire I will be going through in the days and years ahead. I want to be like these men. You have the power to save me and deliver me no matter how big the problem seems. I believe you will. You've promised to. And Lord, even if you don't take me out of the problem, I'm still not going to serve false gods. No matter what anyone else thinks. And I'm expecting you to burn off the things that are tying me down. I want to be fearless. I want to stand for you. And God, I'm asking you to use my pain and use the problems I go through to bring unbelievers to you. Give me a faith that other people want to imitate. I pray this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. time the Lord bless you
shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And Amen. 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 Oh, Jesus, there's no, no one like you. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations come on in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is come on in the morning in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 Well, as we come to a close of this service, um, I just want to go back to the promise of uh, Isaiah 43. We talked about it, uh, this, this sermon was on Daniel 3, but actually there's a great similarity in uh, Isaiah 43. It's God's promise to you, to us. Here it is. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will net not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And four take-homes we had from the Daniel sermon just now is don't worry about defending yourself. Remember, God has the power to save you. Believe God will save you and announce your loyalty to God, no matter what. You can just proclaim your love for Jesus. So with that, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a great week. The truth that I'm significant, you know, I'm worth something. The freedom in Christ experience brought those truths to life. It's more than material, it's more than a seminar, it's more than just one discipleship group. It really is a lifestyle of embracing freedom on a regular basis. I've been proclaiming the Word of God and I've been on the streets talking to people, um, leading people to Christ and it's, it's just been amazing. Well, welcome to Freedom in Christ. The purpose of this course is to help you live as the person God created you to be and do all the things he's prepared in advance for you to do.
Have you ever put on one of these? It's a virtual reality headset. And the idea is that... Today we're going to be looking at the world's view of truth. We're going to be talking about choosing to believe what God says is true. Who sets you free is God. What sets you free is your response to Him and repentance and faith. So we're going to have this great privilege. Being accepted and being significant and being secure. This course is the best decision I've, I've made. I'm, I'm a new person. I don't know, but it's, it's changed me completely. Uh, it's just truth. Truth is what you get out of it. Your eyes will be open. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I was a slave to sin, but now I'm free. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs>